every single one of us as Americans are guaranteed basic fundamental rights and freedoms that are enshrined in our Constitution. But we cannot take these freedoms for granted. I've introduced legislation to stand up for and to protect brave whistleblowers who've come forward to expose illegal actions within our own government or egregious abuses of power and to reform the Espionage Act to make sure that if a whistleblower is prosecuted under the Espionage Act, that they will have their fair day in court, something that is currently not allowable under the law as it stands today. So first I introduced HRS 1162 with my colleague, Congressman Matt Gates, that very simply calls on our government to drop all charges against Edward Snowden for the actions that he took in the public interest to expose a mass government surveillance program on all Americans that violates our privacy and civil liberties and that courts deemed illegal more than once. I also introduced HRS uh, 1175 with my colleague Congressman Tom Massey, which calls for the same action, for the government to drop all charges against Julian Assange, who also acted in the pub uh, public interest as he published information to expose lies and egregious abuses of power in our own government. Last but not least, I introduced a bill, uh, H.R. 8452, to reform the Espionage Act. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg was the first person prosecuted under the 1917 Espionage Act for his act of bravery in releasing the Pentagon Papers to the Washington Post to publish classified documents that exposed the lies that were being told to the American people about what was really happening in the Vietnam War. Now Snowden, Assange, and others are being prosecuted under this same Espionage Act. But as Daniel Ellsberg knows well, under current law, none of them are allowed to speak to the intent of their actions in court. My bill changes that. I'm urging my colleagues in Congress to stand up for the American people, to stand up for our freedoms, and pass this critical legislation now. Since the realization that he is in circumstances where he will inevitably not be able to see us and where he may himself die as a result of increased risk to COVID-19. Every lifeline that we have had in terms of my being able to support him has been shut down. I therefore cannot help him in the way that I have tried to do. I make this statement now only because our lives are on the brink. I fear that Julian could die. I have witnessed the degree of his suffering over a number of years, which I have found shattering, and have tried to help him, but don't any longer know how. I cannot elect to refrain from making this statement if it might assist the court in understanding that the circumstances in which Julian might be granted bail are wholly different from the circumstances of his life, and indeed mine, some eight years ago. Julian Assange and Belmarsh Prison. Let's be clear what Belmarsh is. It's a high security prison, and the regime is brutal. It is absolutely brutal. In the last three months in Belmarsh, there's been two suicides and one murder. Julian himself locked up for 20 hours a day. And then when he meets his legal team, they take those hours off his normal, what they call association, so his free time when he can be out of the cell. He's applied, for example, to go to the gym, like other prisoners. And for weeks he's not been allowed to, and still hasn't been allowed to either. It's the sort of regime that can push you to the edge. It's obviously had the effect on him. There's no doubt about that. He's used all sorts of strategies to make sure that he keeps as well as he possibly can. Obviously, he concentrates and focuses on preparing his case for the court. After two hours, I left that prison more convinced than ever before that this man, first of all, is innocent of the charges that have been brought against him. Secondly, that actually morally, he made the right decision what Julian Assange and his colleagues did was to take the information that they were provided with. Come on, fire! And 
their moral judgment was that these are war crimes being perpetrated here. Oh yeah, look at those dead bastards. In our name, and that they wanted the world to know. We performed a service to society globally, not just within our own countries. He mustn't be extradited to the United States of America, as I don't believe that he'll get a fair trial, a fair hearing. And the risk, therefore, is he could spend uh, the rest of his life in prison. Here we have the potential of the UK government rolling over to extradite someone, when at the same time the US government are refusing to extradite someone who we know is associated with an act that resulted in the loss of life for the Dunn family and needs proper investigation and, yes, if necessary, court action. The one thing you don't extradite people for is on political grounds, and that's what's happening with Julian Assange. But they want to send out a message to others, any other journalists, any other publishers, that this is what will happen to them as well if they dare to speak truth to power in the way that Julian Assange has. In any democracy, one of the key ingredients is to have a free and active media. And sometimes the media will annoy us. They'll tell us as politicians things we don't want to hear, or they'll expose things that we didn't want exposing. But that's what democracy is all about. And as soon as you undermine that right of journalists to report fairly and openly, well, you start undermining the basis of the democracy on which we we rest our society. Information is coming out now which demonstrates the extent to which the US government in particular will go to try and silence him, including the risk to his life. The media has not been kind to Julian Assange in terms of the accurate and honest reporting of his case. What we need now above all else is noise, noise about this case in every form that we can. Understand this isn't about an individual, this is about the right to free speech, the right to whistleblow, the right to stand up against injustice. And if Assange is uh, silenced, they can silence anyone, and they will. Please don't underestimate the importance of this case for the future of our democracy. Social media has been one of the few avenues. Me this week, it's Friday, April 3rd, 2020. 4.14 p.m. I'm making a statement regarding my press release of Tuesday, March 31st. Titled the Advanced Media Group Press Release, subtitle, Then Put in Harm's Way by the County of Lancaster. On Friday, March 27, 2020, I visited the Lancaster City Police Department headquarters and spoke to Officer Binderup and other, one other uniformed officer. I went to complain about the stalking and harassment of neighbors, particularly the Ramirez family of 1252 Fremont Street. I had known Officer Binderup and asked him if he could have an officer send a patrol car to just back up the alley. We had a discussion regarding the harassment and stalking of the occupants and visitors of 1252 Fremont Street and the other neighbors, who again would not, not let me park in the back to unload my mulch. Officer Binderup asked me to file a complaint, another complaint, which I've done too many times. I filed my complaints before they ever started. I asked them to please just run a patrol car down the alley. In addition, right before this, I had two cars trying to rear end me at the Wise Market parking lot. Every time I go to back out of the parking space, there and especially at Walmart or Lincoln Highway, another car in the parking space is across from my own will back out as I do trying to hit my rear end or try to appear to hit my rear end. And I've been rear-ended three or four times in my life and the insurance companies had to pay me. Well, at the same time, an older Spanish male was inches from my front end trying to distract me so that I hit the other car. There was no contact by any of the cars. The day before this, this happened on a red light at Fruitsville Pike when I stopped for a red light. The car behind me tried to push me to go through the light. When I stopped, he was inches from my rear bumper and then went around me, giving me the finger. On Monday, March 30th, 2020, I'd called my Lancaster County Probation Officer, Mark Latou, to report the police contact and to ask him if I am able to carry my pepper spray, which I purchased at an office max several years ago. Remember, I am on 
parole, probation by the Lancaster County Court of Common Pleas until the year 2035 or until I am 76 years old. The probation sentence is from the stalking charges by the Ramirez family, cases number 6520-2017 and 0921-219. If you care to review the, the cases, they are classic Contel Pro arrests all fabricated for the purpose of disposing of all my civil actions in state and federal court, and to cover up the massive fraud and corruption by local, state, and federal officials dating back to the original ISC whistleblowing activities of 1987. There already have been some 33 false arrests with dismissed charges in the county of Lancaster since 1987. In 1987, when the extortion and fraud of my company, Financial Management Group Limited, and the first digital movie, Joint Venture, there were five felonies and four misdemeanors charged by the, by the Manon Township Police Department on September 2, 1987. All charges were dismissed in March of 1988 by then Lancaster County District Attorney Joseph Maddenspacher, former judge of the Lancaster County Court of Common Pleas. Only a few months after the Ferrani ISC, International Signal Control, merger was completed, they dismissed all the charges. Ronnie was a leading defense contractor headquartered in London. I also reported the police contact. What, what did I get from Lancaster County Probation Officer Mark Ratu on Monday, this past Monday, Stan? I think you should call your counselor, Ken Ruffner, and talk to him. You sound frustrated, and I would not recommend you use the pepper spray. You have not been trained to use it. I told him that Ken Ruffner called me last week and, and is taking time off due to the coronavirus until further notice. Mark Ratu called me back and gave me the name of a supervisor at Community Services Group to talk to. I called the supervisor who scheduled me for a telehealth video chat at 1.45 p.m. that day. Then after working outside my backyard screened in porch, I went inside to rest and treat my crippled backs, back and legs, only to come outside and find my porch and backyard terrorized, broken locks on my large toolbox, newly painted landscape timber scraps, and screen door jammed again. Instead of getting police protection, I'm again put in harm's way of physical violence and more harassment and stalking by the Lancaster County community. Over the past few months, since March 27th to 30th days, I have had my iPod docking station radio vandalized, all of my hand cleaners stolen, my carpets in my patio moved after I glued them, my razor blades for shaving stolen, my dishwashing soap stolen, my white cap with the light stolen a few weeks ago, a pair of pants stolen last week. So far, the cost of this vandalism and thefts since 2006, since I moved into 1253 Mont Street, is over $24,000. Insurance companies don't pay. At Stonehill Road in Conestoga, I was paid twice by insurance companies. The cost just since being released from Lancaster County Prison on October 3rd, 2019 is over $4,000. This is the end of my statement. Again, it's Friday, April 3rd, 2020, at 4.20 p.m. This is Stan J. Catterbone and the Advanced Media Group, and I'm at 1253 on my street, Lancaster, PA, 17603. Thank you.
Iraqi Scud missiles, crude, inaccurate, and for the most part, ineffective. But the Iraqi military was well on its way to developing a far more powerful and accurate ballistic missile, one that was intended to carry nuclear warheads. And federal investigators tell us that some of the necessary equipment being used in that program came from the United States. If there were no vices with the shipments, I am absolutely shocked to learn that that sort of activity was taking place. This is ACU Nightline, reporting from Washington, Ted Collins. Television and investigative journalism is something of an uneasy mash. Television news thrives on immediacy, so investigations take time. Television stories need picture, video. Investigations attempt to uncover events that someone has tried to conceal. It's difficult to illustrate a cover-up, so try to be patient with us.
What we're going to report tonight is part of an ongoing investigative effort by ABC News Nightline and the Financial Times of London. It is only one piece of what we believe to be a much larger fabric. But let's focus on what a number of sources, both inside and outside the U.S. government, have already confirmed for us. Remember the two scenes? They were shot by an ABC News camera team in Baghdad on the night of January 16th, when U.S. aircraft began their bombing campaign against the Iraqi capital. That blizzard of anti-aircraft fire was directed in part by a radar tracking system sold to the Iraqi government by a company in South Africa. The South Africans sold quite a number of militarily useful items to Iraq, including cluster bombs and diffusers. Those sales were handled by a Chilean middleman. But South Africa also conveyed to Baghdad some key technology that Iraq was using in the development of its ballistic missile system. All of this, the radar tracking system, the cluster bomb technology, the ballistic missile components, was sold by South Africa to Iraq. But most of what they sold, the South Africans had purchased from a company here in the United States. Officers of the CIA knew about those sales from the United States to South Africa, knew what was going, knew how it was getting there. Even though such sales were and are against the law, the CIA did nothing to stop them. Nightline correspondent Jeff Greenfield has details of the story that was compiled by reporters from ABC News Nightline and the Financial Times. When you talk about the American heartland, you're talking about a place like Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's Amish country. It's small town Main Street. It's Norman Rockwell Public, the Saturday evening post. Lancaster, Pennsylvania was also the home of International Signal Control, a homegrown business that was a major regional employer and whose founder and chairman, James Garron, was a generous regional benefactor. Garron was probably the greatest philanthropist in the decade of the 80s that Lancaster had ever known. There was something unknowable about the nature of this village, but it was a story thought to be okay that that government stuff was just somehow in their head. What ISC did was to make or supply military hardware and components, everything from cluster bombs to state-of-the-art electronic gear to blueprints, so their customers could build bomb factories of their own. But it's not what ISC made or supplied that has made it the target of federal prosecutors for the last two years. It's where ISC's equipment and technology and know-how wound up and how it got there. An ABC Nightline Financial Times investigation has unraveled a startling story with three key elements. First, that highly sophisticated technology flowed from ISC to South Africa, including technology critical to long-range missile development. Missiles, missiles capable of delivering nuclear weapons. weapons. Second, this technology went from the United States to South Africa in clear violation of the law. Third, these shipments went on for years with the full knowledge of Central Intelligence Agency officials. What's more, federal investigators say they have good reason to believe that some of this technology, including ballistic missile technology, shipped illegally from ISC to South Africa was in turn sold to Iraq, where it wound up as part of Saddam Hussein's military machine that the U.S. fought against in the Gulf War. If these reports are true, and uh, I take it there's a great deal of evidence that suggests that they are, uh, then we have a renegade operation on our hands uh, for whom the rule of law means nothing, uh, for which the elected representatives apparently have no control, have no ability to direct policy, have no ability to say what they can and cannot do. It all started legally, if covertly, back in 1974. That's when the National Security Agency, a super-secret U.S. intelligence unit, asked ISC to help it complete Project X, a chain of electronic listening posts based at South Africa's Simon's Town Naval Station. South Africa was using these posts to follow Soviet submarine traffic off the Cape of Good Hope. To ensure secrecy, ISC and the NSA made sure the shipments could not be traced back to them. They created a company called Gamma Systems Associates, 
In fact, this company was nothing more than a post office box at John F. Kennedy Airport. Gamma was a cutout. In other words, it's a straw man company, which uh, is technically not part of the government, but it's agreeable to the wishes of the government. But this sanction and covert operation stopped in 1977, when President Carter, a strong opponent of South Africa's apartheid regime, told the U.S. firm to stop any military-related business with Pretoria. But ISC continued shipping electronics, some civilians, some military, to South Africa. Then in the early 1980s, South Africa began to intensify its efforts at ballistic missile development. For ISC, that was a golden opportunity because one of its top executives was a man named Clyde Ivey, an American electronics expert who has been called the father of South Africa's missile program. Ivey had extraordinary contacts in that nation's defense structure. Beginning in 1984, federal investigators say, senior ISC executives, including Clyde Ivey, began regular contact with CIA officials. And, these investigators add, the CIA officials had already been following what ISC was sending to South Africa. Over the next four years, the agency learned the whole picture. Reporter Tom Flannery is part of the ABC Financial Times investigation. Well, they knew that ISC was uh, utilizing a former national security agency cutout company, Gamma Systems Associates, to ship large volumes of very expensive, highly sophisticated military equipment illegally to South Africa from 1984 through 1989. And did the CIA tell anybody at all about it? They told not a soul, neither law enforcement nor legislative. And what specifically did the CIA know that ISC was sending to South Africa? Some of the most sophisticated electronic gear imaginable. Telemetry tracking equipment used to receive signals from missiles. Gyroscopes used to guide the missiles. called film readers used to monitor a missile's performance. This equipment is exactly what a country would need to develop, test, and perfect long-range nuclear-capable ballistic missiles, which is what South Africa was doing in the mid-1980s. I think it's inconceivable that the equipment would be used for any other purpose. This was not small-scale business. The telemetry tracking equipment alone added up to nearly 20 tons, enough to fill a healthy chunk of the 747 cargo plane. Not everything ISC shipped was so enormous, but ISC was shipping equipment to South Africa almost every week for four years, much of it through the Gamma Systems Associate cutout. Moreover, this flatly illegal business went on, leaving an elaborate paper trail, utterly unimpeded by U.S. law enforcement, right up until the end of 1988. I would be shocked, and I would feel that I had been lied to if any sort of operation were going on in which the agency or any other intelligence organization was trying to abuse customs by going around it or going through it. Indeed, the laws on the books passed by the Congress couldn't have been clearer in banning the sale of American military technology to South Africa. But there's another more disturbing twist to this tale of illegal arms shipments. Once the American-made hardware went to South Africa, it didn't stop there. South Africa, after all, is a major arms industry. And, as former Ambassador Herman Nichols says, it was an industry in the mid-1980s very hungry for customers. I think the South Africans at that stage you know, were quite keen to, to sell almost anywhere. Including Iraq. For instance, ISC sold South Africa fuses for cluster bombs, one of the most effective killing machines around. South Africa took that technology and, in turn, sold hundreds of thousands of bomb fuses to Iraq a deal brokered by Chilean arms merchant Carlos Cardoon, one of the biggest suppliers of weapons to a grateful Saddam Hussein. In other instances, American technology went directly from South Africa to Iraq. What kind of technology? Well, look again at this incredible footage from the bombing of Baghdad on January 16th. That, says one American law enforcement official, that was some of the stuff that got through Iraq through the ISC shipments to South Africa. In this case, electronic components of a South African radar system guiding Iraq's anti-aircraft guns. Finally, federal investigators say even American missile technology made its way from Lancaster, Pennsylvania 
to South Africa to Iraq. Had the Gulf War not intervened, Saddam Hussein would have been well on the way to developing an operational Condor II missile, giving him, with the critical help of American-born technology, the power to deliver chemical or even nuclear weapons anywhere in the Middle East. I'm Jeff Greenfield for Nightline. We contacted the CIA this morning, gave them the broad outlines of the story you've just heard and seen, and requested a reaction. At 7.15 this evening, the agency faxed to us the following statement. The Central Intelligence Agency declines to comment on these allegations concerning the activities of the International Signal and Control Corporation. However, it is the CIA's policy to cooperate fully with the Department of Justice on matters relating to possible violations of U.S. laws. We suggest that Nightline contact the Department of Justice regarding these allegations. That statement, as you may have noticed, is silent on the allegations of CIA misconduct. But, as suggested, we contacted Justice. It was by then, of course, after business hours, but a Justice Department spokesman returned our call. His statement was even simpler than the CIA's. It is not something we would comment on, one way or the other. When we come back, we'll discuss the implications of this story. Joining us now here in our Washington bureau are Senator Aaron Specter of Pennsylvania, who served on the Senate Intelligence Committee during the years when the weapons transfer took place. Jeffrey Kemp, a member of the Reagan administration's National Security Council and author of a forthcoming book on the global arms race. Stephen Bryan, former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, whose job was to stop the transfer of weapons technology. And one of the principal reporters in this investigation, Lionel Barber of the Financial Times of London. Senator Specter, as I just noted, you were a member of the Intelligence Committee during this period. Uh, should such an operation, had it been sanctioned, have come to the attention of your committee or some other congressional committee? Uh, if, in fact, there was such an operation, and I'm answering a hypothetical question because we only have the allegations, it would be the responsibility of the CIA to tell the Intelligence Committee under applicable law. They'd have to give a timely notification. Would you be free to tell us if indeed such notification was made? No, I would not be free to tell you one way or the other because all of that would be secret. But I can give you this generalization uh, that in the period from December of 1986 after Iran-Contra broke, uh, there was a very intense effort made by CIA uh, to be extremely careful on notification of covert activity. You and I spoke the other day, uh, and we were discussing in general terms the inclination of the Bush administration now to be responsive to this kind of thing. In other words, to make sure that, that Congress is not. Uh, and, and if memory serves me correctly, you were suggesting that the, the administration really is disinclined to do that. Well, I believe that the president uh, is inclined to make no covert operations. Uh, there has been a refusal on part of counsel to the president, but I'll be specific, uh, Boyden Gray, the uh, lawyer who counseled the president, who very strenuously resisted an effort to have a statutory notification put into law. Uh, uh, the uh, officials around the president and the National Security Council, according to my understanding, and I've had it from very authoritative sources, were willing to have a statutory 48-hour notice, but Mr. Gray, Gordon Gray, the counsel to the president, was adamant in refusal on the ground that would impinge on the president's constitutional authority. Mr. Bryan, I, I know you're somewhat skeptical just of the general notion that this kind of weapons technology would flow from the United States to South Africa. Is that correct? Well, I'm, I'm more uh, skeptical about it flowing to Iraq. I worked on the Condor case. In fact, I uh, tried to block it, and I think we mortally wounded that project, and I never heard of any technology coming out of uh, South Africa. Primary source was West Germany uh, and Italy, and to a lesser extent, Argentina. But what about the notion of this kind of technology flowing from the United States to South Africa? Well, we, we tried very hard during this uh, period to interdict any technology that we knew of going to South Africa or to any other country that was blocked from receiving military technology from the United States. And uh, this is a, a story that I never have heard before. Uh, does, it, does it surprise you that weapons technology would flow, perhaps even without the knowledge of senior officials at the Defense Department? Uh, 
uh, nothing ever surprises me nowadays, but uh, it's certainly not a story that we knew of uh, at the time that I served in the uh, Reagan administration. Dr. Kemp, uh, give us your sense of what justification, because indeed the whole notion, A, of weapons technology flowing from the United States to South Africa, and then B, as Mr. Bryan suggests, uh, that technology flowing from South Africa to Iraq, on the face of it, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, the South Africans and the Israelis, for example, are very close. The Israelis and the Iraqis are and have been for a long time bitter enemies. How, how could one justify something like that, even from a purely logical point of view? Well, I have no idea what the real story is, but in the, certainly in the 70s, remember, we were concerned about the Cape route, the flow of oil around the Cape route, and Soviet uh, warships, and that could be a reason for having some understanding with the South Africans. I think that was the reason. In the 1980s, it, could, it might have had something to do with us wanting to know what the South Africans knew about Israeli nuclear weapons and what the cooperation was, if any, between South Africa and Israel. That's purely hypothetical on my case. But, you know, in the past, technology has been used as a hard currency to get things or to persuade governments to do things that it might not otherwise want to do. This may be a case where that was going on. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I'd like to go to my colleague, Lionel Barber, and Continuing now with Lionel Barber of the Financial Times. Lionel, uh, some of our guests here are skeptical, which is understandable, because so were you and I when we first began getting acquainted with this story. Uh, speak for a moment, if you would, about the, uh, about the documentary evidence that relates specifically to the transfer of the technology from the United States to South Africa. Well, we have got uh, Bill's lady um, uh, referring to the technology which left JFK Airport, and it specifically notes that the items concerned, missile technology and other advanced weapons, required export licenses. Uh, we know that they did not have export licenses and therefore were in violation of U.S. law. Is there any reason to believe that there could have been, and I'd like you to explain if you would, uh, what the presidential finding is, that there might have been a presidential finding which, which, which could have perhaps set aside even U.S. law uh, and, and permitted this kind of an operation to go forward? Well, a presidential finding, uh, which is uh, the court sees uh, a uh, covert operation as in the national interest uh, of the United States, would have to be uh, passed on, or the information would have to go to relevant congressional, uh, senior congressional members. And we have contacted several of those who would have been in a position to know, who ought to have been told, and they say they know nothing about this at all. But I think there's a very important point here today. The fact is that uh, informed officials in and outside the government have told us that actually the CIA knew about these shipments but it was not a sanctioned covert operation. And in that respect, they wouldn't have had to inform Congress. But there's only one problem here, and that is that if CIA officials were aware of legal of of violations of the law, they needed to pass on the information to the Justice Department, and they did not. Mr. Bryan, uh, you were shaking your head a moment ago. Why? Well, because it's not the CIA's job to enforce the law. Their job is to provide the information to the government officials who, who have that responsibility. And, and uh, typically, uh, uh, they know about thousands and thousands of, of these kinds of things that go on, and they, they report them diligently, and the government officials try to sort through them, try to pick out the ones they think are the most uh, serious to, to go after them and, and to deal with them. Well, well so if I could just come back here, I think uh, the fact is that we know that there were breaches of the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act in 1986, Export Administration Act, uh, the U.S. arms embargo. I mean, there was plenty of evidence to suggest uh, that, that there were violations of the law and that the CIA had a responsibility to pass on that information to the Department of Justice. Yeah, well, may I raise a question, please? Uh, a key point which has been made here is whether the matter was sanctioned by the CIA. Now, that's really the critical factor. The obligation of the CIA report to the intelligence community and the obligation of the CIA to report violations of law arises when the officials, responsible officials of the CIA knows about it. When Lionel uses the word sanction, the question
question arises in my mind as to whether it was a rogue operation uh, not known to the top officials of the CIA. Uh, when Lima was documenting uh, certain bills of lading for the transactions of South Africa, I would be interested if he cares to, to document the uh, evidence that shows knowledge on the part of uh, CIA top officials uh, to show that it was in fact sanctioned. Well, we have uh, been working on this story for a number of years. We have contacted dozens of people. We have interviewed people over and over again. And we have uh, several sources who say that there were regular briefings between ISC uh, executives and CIA officers on what was going out from Lancaster, Pennsylvania to South Africa. Whether that information was passed up the ladder higher up to uh, senior CIA uh, officials, uh, I do not know. Let me raise a somewhat broader question and, and pose it again to Senator Specker. I thought, uh, and you used a term which had a great resonance in the mid-70s, a rogue operation. I thought that kind of thing was supposed to have been brought under control. Well, uh, it is supposed to have been brought under control, uh, but I picked up Lyman's term on sanction, and he injected the concept that the operation may not have, uh, have been sanctioned. If there's any evidence that anybody from the CIA was involved, I can tell you flatly uh, that the Senate Intelligence Committee, which I had served on, and the House Intelligence Committee for that matter, would be very interested to pursue the matter. And it may well be, and I would expect that uh, the top CIA officials would be too. If there is evidence, uh, it ought to be pursued in official channels as well as the investigation, which, of course, uh, uh, the Financial Times has every right, uh, as every right line to pursue. Let me just warn our affiliates that we're going to be going a, a few minutes over our allotted time tonight so that we can complete uh, at least this phase of the story. Uh, and let me just put to uh, Dr. Kent for a moment. What we are discussing here, Dr. Kent, is, after all, uh, not just an occasional shipment, but almost weekly shipments that went on for four years including some very sophisticated, militarily important equipment that went aboard South African Airways from JFK to Pretoria, as I say, week after week after week, over a period of four to five years. Yes, we saw the allegations made by Richard Fabian, the self-professed crime chief, and now awaiting trial for security charges in the Florida jail. Have you ever met Richard Fabian? During the seventies and eighties, today was indicted along with other executives who worked at International Signal and Control. News has been following this story for years. Tonight, Susan Shapiro begins our coverage from the federal courthouse in Philadelphia. 
155 million. At a packed news conference, U.S. Attorney Michael Bailson detailed major indictments against James Barron and other top executives of International Signal and Control. The Lancaster defense contractor is accused of masterminding a scheme that involved illegal arms sales and a $1 billion fraud. The purpose of the financial fraud was to make phony contracts look authentic and to build up the value of ISC into something that it was not. The enormous and complex scheme, which was described as looping, was apparently enough to defraud British defense contractor Ferranti International, which merged with ISC in 1987. Ferranti itself initially couldn't believe that they had been defrauded until our agents explained the depth of the problem to them. Ferranti told News 8, we have been cooperating with the U.S. government and are glad to see those efforts come to fruition. Garen is charged with eight counts, including financial fraud, mail fraud, security fraud, money laundering, and violation of arms control laws. Officials of six federal agencies who work here show off some of the weapons they say ISC shipped illegally to South Africa and in turn ended up in Iraq during the Persian Gulf War. After the war with Iraq, proximity fuses like this were found in southern Iraq. Inside were power supplies that could be traced to ISC in Lancaster. And from a DOD standpoint, the flagrancy of this case is that ISC and its officials put greed and the ability to make a buck ahead of our fighting men. Joseph Tate issued a statement, statement saying that technology is known around the world and anyone can obtain it. In addition, officials here would not comment on an allegation that the CIA had full knowledge of the arms shipments. Many government agencies, including the CIA, cooperated in this investigation, and I think I should just leave it as that. Garen, who's made a plea agreement with the federal government, was not arrested, but other top company executives who worked closely with him were taken into custody in Lancaster and arraigned in Philadelphia. Terrence Bowles was picked up at his home in Holtwood. Thomas Jackson was picked up at his home on Butter Road. Robert Clyde Ivey, who's also known as Greenlee, was arrested at his residence on Cochrane Drive. And Wayne Radcliffe here at his home on Grand Oak Place. His relatives didn't want to talk. No. This news conference attracted media from all over, including London. We're asking for the major British company and the billion dollar fraud here is expected uh, the city of London. Affected a lot of people, so what began as a very small defense firm in Lancaster, Pennsylvania has now turned into an international scandal. Just take a look. You go to the hospital and the doctor's clearing it. And you're, and you're talking about demons. What are the demons? The voices. Well, tell me about it. What are the voices about? It's, it's, not, it's another voice, the evil side. Uh huh. How long has that voice been going on? Years. Okay. When did it start, do you think? When your mom passed? It started you know, worse when my mom passed. Okay. Did it start? How many years before your mom passed, do you think? When my father died. Okay. Did you ever tell anybody about the voice? Never? And what does the voice say to you? Well, what does it tell you to do? Burn, kill, destroy. Okay. Burn, kill, destroy what? Anything. Okay. But have you ever burned, killed, or destroyed anything? What have you burned, killed, or destroyed? To burn, to set fire. To to what? In the pit, fire. Oh, a fire pit. Okay, well, I mean, the voice told you to throw something. You built built the fire, the fire pit. What's destructive about that? That's what fire pits are made for. What else did the voice tell you to do? That's kill animals. Okay, have you ever killed animals? Yes. What kind of animals? Birds. Birds. Wild birds or people's birds. pets. How do you kill them? How do you kill them? Wait for them to kill them. 
Oh, can't catch him, so how are you waiting for him? There's no way I'm, I'm, I'm a bird lover. There's no way you can't catch a bird, Holmes. No, I mean, I, but, but, with the color gun? Oh, okay. Where's, where's your color gun? Okay. All right. So the voices tell you to to, to herd animals and start fires in the fire pit. Uh, and you never told anybody. You never told your mom. You never told your brother. You told Zach about it. I don't know. I asked Fairly, you earlier what Zach's phone was. Do you really remember that? Where's your phone at now? Was it on you when the police stopped you? He was trained by the military to shoot. But is that the phone number in the ROTC program no? for high school? When was the last time you spoke to Zach? Same night. thing with the Stabbins so in Diego, Fort Lauderdale, where I followed the he They're all ex-military, and they all get he passed through the system. Friend, brother. Who's as far as being 302, mental health orders and things like that, they when always get a pass. When you talked to him last month, did he tell you who was there? Did he stay with some kind of relative? Family friend? You know the family friend's name? I'm sorry, I don't remember. What do you think about that while we're talking? Because other than Zach, who else have you told about this voice? No one. No one. Okay. And I can't remember, did you say you told your mom before she passed? No? Okay, so Zach's the only one you ever told. How about Emily? Did you ever tell Emily about the voice? I think I did. You think you did? You're not sure though? Not sure. You know Emily's last name? Renner. Renner? Okay. Is she still a student out there? Huh? Is she still a student out at Douglas? She doesn't go to Douglas. She doesn't go to Douglas anymore? All right. So let's talk about the last couple of days. When was the last time you heard the voice? Yesterday. What time was it yesterday? Night. And where were we at? Work. You're at work? So you're at Dollar Tree. And what's the voice telling you? To hurt people. To hurt people at Dollar Tree? Or hurt people? Hurt people at Dollar Tree. Okay. Didn't say specifically who? Alright. So what happens? Is it, do you hear the voice this morning or no? You know, what, what's the voice saying this morning? Okay, right, let's talk about it. Did the voice, the voice didn't tell you to take Uber, right? Yes, it did. It did? Yes. The voice said take Uber. Did the, the, vo the voice says, it's in here. You're the voice. No, there's, there's the, in here. Okay, it's in your head. Yes. What, is it a male voice or a female voice? Yeah. Male? Can you tell how old the voice is? Okay. Do you have a good voice too, or just a bad voice? There's a, there's a, is there a voice inside of you that says, do good things? No? Yeah, can't be. You held down a job for two years. If you were doing things bad, you wouldn't be able to hold a job down for two years, right? Okay. I mean, look. Everybody has. Everybody, everybody, it's me and my bad side. I understand. Everybody's got a quote, good and bad side. There's people. No, it's, it's, it's a voice. The voice is in here. And it's me. It's struggling me. It's trying to be different. Okay. But obviously, again, when you say it's a voice, it's you. It's all you. The voice is you as well. Yeah. The voice didn't force you to do anything, right? No, the voice did. It's two voices. Uh -huh. it, it, there's one half that's a good and one a bad. Yeah. Okay, well, the voice tells me to go to lunch and not pay for my meal, but I pay for my meal because I know that's the right thing to do, right? You've asked two or three times to me today that you don't deserve yeah. something. You, since me and you have been talking, have you heard the voices? What's it say? Yourself. For you to cut yourself. Does the voice like me? Does the voice like me? Doesn't trust me. Why doesn't he trust me? Well, 
Pretty relaxed, eh? I'm trying, I'm trying to figure that out, too. Well, what does he like about me? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of grilling you because I want to know what, what the voice's problem is with me. What does he like about me? I treated you fairly, I give you your water. I talk nice to you. You know, I'm too nice. I'm too nice. Yeah. How many times has the voice talked to you while we've been in the room here? A lot. Does the voice say jump out of the chair and do anything bad to that policeman? Same voice up now. I don't really believe there is a voice. Honestly. No, I don't think there is. I'm trying to think of something. No. I mean, I feel you probably want to kill yourself because of what happened, but. No, the, the voice is telling me to kill myself. Okay, but the voice is telling you that the AR 15s is. You like guns, man. You want to be a ranger. You like guns. It's all right. There's cops like that. There's cops who got a 50 million guns. You didn't buy guns because the voice said, hey, today I like Mossbergs, tomorrow I like AR-15s. You like guns. Can, can, can you call a psychologist? I, 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 I get it. I've already got the questions from some of the psychologists. Some of the questions I asked you were Is from. It? Yeah. I see. Well, that's what I asked you. You ready? Yeah. Voices. Are the inside or outside of your head? What do the voices say? And these are all questions I asked you. How many voices? You said one. Whose voice do you think it was? You didn't know. I don't know. I, I don't understand why you can't be like guns. There's lots of guys who like guns. You never kept any kind of diary, though, right? With these voices. Why didn't you? Why didn't you ever tell anybody or your brother about the voices? Trying to get help. Clicking record. So, welcome everyone. Good evening. I'm very happy to be here this evening with Dr. Robert Duncan. This is Ramola D from Ramola D Reports, and I'm here with a very special interview today. Um, Robert Duncan has consented to do a live stream, so we are all going to be treated to a live interview this evening. Uh, Robert Duncan, as many people may know, is a scientist and an author. He is the author of The Matrix Deciphered and Project Soul Catcher, which many people may have read and may know about. And um, he's requested to introduce himself. So I'm going to turn the floor over to him right away. And uh, Robert, do please tell us more, because that's part of what we wanted to start with, really, this evening, your background and who you are and the work you've done. Yeah, you know, I. I... I'm somewhat shy about talking about my background, but uh, I have uh, many degrees from uh, great universities, Ivy Leagues, um, and I, uh, I work for uh, the ABC companies that are often called uh, uh, DARPA, projects for the CIA, projects for the Department of Justice, projects for the Army, Navy. Examples of such projects are uh, reading brainwaves to control robots. Uh, I wrote the artificial intelligence code to track the uh, nuclear, uh, the submarine fleets around the world, uh, robotic surgery and medicine. And it was, it's been quite an interesting career um and of uh, they could only have kept me dumb and i loved my job uh but i found out that uh, people were using my work for amoral activities not just for defense of my country and to capture criminals they were using it for uh, other purposes uh, within my own country, and uh, I, I could not have that. I, uh, I've been an international business consultant, a professor, you know, a long career of doing many things. Um, but I got into this uh, line of research 
um, because I was, I thought I would be the first to do human brain uh, communications. Um, I, I'm sorry, uh, computer to uh, human brain communications. And um, I found out this group of targeted individuals which were complaining about the exact thing that you would expect from a weaponized version of BCI or brain computer interfacing technologies or brain to brain interfacing technologies. And I'm like, this is a bit coincidental and rarely am I the first to discover anything. So uh, I did more research, thoroughly convinced <laughs> after working on it, portions of it for the, uh, for DARPA and then realizing, oh my gosh, this is my work they're using to harm people. Um, and, uh, and is it possible so that the work that you were doing was set up in such a way that it could have been used in that way? Oh yeah, absolutely. But remember, we're lied to as scientists and we're compartmentalized. Uh, so I was doing, let's say I worked on voice morphing technology. Well, that was supposed to be used on enemy communications to sound like the general uh, over the battlefield of the adversary and misdirect them. Well, I see that with TIs as well. They hear their parents' voice, uh, voice morphing and talking about them behind their back and being used in very deceptive ways. Same with voice recognition. Um, uh, so in a sense, you were portion. putting two and two together. The work that yeah. you had done, you were suddenly finding was being reported in the community from various people as yeah. occurring to them. Correct, correct. And, uh, and then, so that led me on this, oh, jeez, it's been so long, at least 22 decade journey of researching and alerting the public to these technologies. Uh, I went was this to, back uh, in the 90s or 80s, uh, Robert? I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just uh, trying to get a sense of the time. Yeah, uh, around 2000. Around 2000. Around 2000. And, uh, you know, I even went with the former head of the LA FBI uh, to Congress, uh, spoke to the Judiciary Committee, the Armed Forces Committee, 20. three senators, uh, and most importantly, the Intelligence Committee, and they are supposed to be the oversight. Uh, it was obvious to me that this was MK Ultra on steroids, same tactics being used, the mind control, the breakdown of the human uh, will, and using those programmed assassins or uh, Manchurian candidates or whatever their desire may be, just eliminate the target. Uh, and uh, f the further I followed the white rabbit down the hole, more disturbing it got. <laughs> um, this and, is absolutely uh, incredible. First of all, thank you for doing that, for going to Congress and going and speaking to these Senate committees and to the Senate Intelligence Com Committee, etc. Uh, faith of my government. How <laughs> was that event? Um, <laughs> the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, said, we've never heard of MKUltra. And that's their one job was to know Everybody's the heard of MKUltra. And so both the FBI, you know, the head of the FBI and I look at each other like, oh, this is not going to go well. They're starting off with a lie. <laughs> They've never heard of this. Uh, but Frank Church, ironically, I ended up in Idaho, um, in Frank Church, the center of the- Where the, you are. Yeah, where I am that started the investigations into MKUltra. Uh, and now, you know, it's gone through so many name changes. We just use that as an anchor point, but uh, it, it, who knows what the new budget, the new name is at this point. Well, you see, this is the whole thing, right? And this is part of what I hope we can talk about a little bit further. This is the whole issue, not just of compartmentalization, but about secrecy. There's a lot, uh, there's a huge interest in keeping things secret, right? Well, and I, I learned why is because most humans want to do good. They want to believe they are doing good. And especially if you work for government, you know, you feel patriotic and you feel 
good, that pride, you know, flowing through your brains, uh, your veins. And uh, if you knew the truth, you wouldn't do your job. And so they have to keep it compartmentalized. Oh, you uh, mean they're actually fooling the very people who are working for them? Yes, correct. Only. This really is a battle over press freedom, over the rule of law, over the future, I would say, even of democracy, because democracy, which means that the people control governmental power, this can not exist with secrecy. Yeah? You, you deprive the public of their right to know, and you deprive them of the tools to control the government. It, this really is a battle over press freedom, over the rule of law, over the future, I would say, even of democracy, because democracy, which means that the people control governmental power, this can not exist with secrecy. Yeah? You, you deprive the public of their right to know, and you deprive them of the tools to control the government. It Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people, for I have complete confidence and the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, Without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. 
That is why the Athenian lawmaker Solon decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. With Julian Assange, he's standing by from his safe room at the Ecuadorian Embassy in London. First, our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, has more on Assange and the assistance WikiLeaks is providing to NSA leaker Edward Snowden. Good morning, Pierre. Good morning, George. WikiLeaks officials were with Snowden when he fled from Hong Kong to Russia, and they have provided him with legal guidance. Assange is said to be pressing Ecuadorian officials to grant Snowden's request for asylum. Some say it's the latest provocation of the U.S. He has long been a prickly thorn in the side of the U.S. government. But who is Julian Assange? Hacker, activist, a journalist, or fugitive criminal? We've exposed the world's secrets. He is the mastermind behind WikiLeaks, which has published the secrets of nations and is now at the heart of a global debate over the public's right to know. The WikiLeaks organization published hundreds more internal government documents. Assange has embarrassed the powerful and revealed top secret information about U.S. and other government activities. Got a bunch of bodies laying there. But at what cost? It puts people's lives in danger, threatens our national security. Now the man who has been on a crusade to expose what he believes is wrongdoing faces accusations of his own. You have no right to arrest Julian Assange. For more than a year, he's been holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London where he sought refuge to avoid possible criminal charges. And today, WikiLeaks and Assange are standing shoulder to shoulder with perhaps the most damaging leaker of them all, Edward Snowden, the fugitive former government contractor who went public with top secret information about some of the crown jewels of the intelligence community. Some U.S. officials say, make no mistake, these, are se these leaks have serious consequences, that the terrorists are changing the way they communicate because of these disclosures. George? Okay, Pierre, thanks. Let's talk now to Julian Assange from the Ecuadorian Embassy in London, joined here in New York by Jesslyn Radak, a former whistleblower from the Justice Department who disclosed details of post-9-11 interrogation practices, now with the Government Accountability Project. Welcome to you both. And Mr. Assange, let me begin with you. Thank you for joining us. What can you tell us about where Edward Snowden is right now and where he's expected to go? Uh, thank you. Thank you, George. I, mean, I wish I could <clears throat> answer these uh, questions of yours in more detail. The situation now with Edward Snowden is a very sensitive one. It's a matter of uh, international diplomatic uh, negotiations. So the <clears throat> there's little that I can productively say about uh, what is happening uh, directly. Uh, but look, let's pull back a bit. Uh, why is it that Mr. Snowden uh, is not in the United States? Uh, he should feel that he should be afforded justice uh, in the United States. States. Uh, but his situation is very similar to a situation that I face uh, and that my staff uh, face, where we have been sucked into a, a grand jury in Alexandria, Virginia. That's where the charges for Mr. Snowden came from, Alexandria, Virginia. But what do we know about that district? It's six kilometres from the centre of Washington, D.C. Uh, the jury pool is made up of CIA 
Pentagon, uh, et cetera. Uh, in the legal community in the United States, it's known as the, the rocket docket because of the lack of scrutiny proce procedures have there. Uh, there's a 99% chance that if you're, sorry, a 99.97% chance uh, that if you're a, a target of a grand jury, you'll be indicted, and a 99% chance uh, that if you're indicted by a grand jury, you'll be convicted. So this is not a situation, uh, ignoring all the political rhetoric which we've seen, which has been terrible over the past two weeks, uh, where Mr Snowden uh, can feel that he would be afforded justice. But is there uh, any the country States. right so now that will grant our, Mr our Snowden advice, a, uh, asylum? Well, under UN conventions, Mr Snowden has the right uh, to apply to nearly every country uh, for asylum. Of course, asylum decisions are always a mixture um, of the political and the legal. Um, and I think there are, there are several countries where it is politically possible uh, for Mr Snowden to receive asylum, and many countries, of course, uh, where he's legally uh, entitled uh, to that kind of protection. Uh, it's, no one is alleging that any of his acts are anything uh, other than political, uh, that he has acted in a, in a manner uh, to draw attention to a very serious problem uh, in the United States where um, without the, the will of Congress, without the will of the American population, we now have a, a state within a state we have a transnational surveillance apparatus. Glenn Greenwald just last night spoke about how a new technology to be rolled out by the National Security Agency uh, is going to attempt to intercept one billion uh, mobile phone calls with a day. No one signed up for this. Obama does not have a mandate for that. With respect, no one has Mr. Assange, many people Congress have come back to the United States if he would not be detained or imprisoned prior to trial, if he would not be subject to a gag order, if he would be tried in the venue of his choosing. Do you think it would make sense for Snowden to return under those circumstances? I actually don't. I have represented people like Thomas Drake, who was an NSA whistleblower, who actually did go through every conceivable internal channel possible, including his boss, the inspector general of his agency, the Defense Department inspector general, and two congressional committees, and the U.S. turned around and prosecuted him and did so for espionage and threatened to tie him up for the rest of his life in jail. I think Snowden's outlook is bleak here. And instead of focusing on Snowden and shooting the messenger, we should really focus on the crimes of the NSA. Because whatever laws Snowden may or may not have broken, they are infinitesimally small compared to the two major surveillance laws and the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution but these that NSA has violated. As the President has pointed out, were passed by the Congress or overseen by a court. Well, the, both of those are incorrect. Congress has not been fully informed. Only they have the, passed the laws. The there intel. is oversight. There is okay, but there's oversight. a secret interpretation of Section 215 of the Patriot Act, which nobody knows except for the intel committee of Congress, and even they say that they think most Americans would be appalled by that. And to say that it's been approved by the courts is a misnomer because it gives the impression that federal courts have improved this, when in reality, it's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which has rubber stamped which every Which is a single... federal court. No, it is a secret court set up at the Justice Department that has federal judges on it, but it, last year, it approved 2,000 out of 2,000 applications. They hear only the government side, and they've never, they've rejected an application one time since 1978. Let me bring this back to you.